first I'm going to talk briefly um, before I read my poems. And my talk is inspired by my Radcliffe uh, fellow fellows, many of whom have expressed to me over the past nine months or so, me the lone poet in the cohort, that they wish that they understood poetry better, its meaning and its purpose. Um, I remember being out on the lawn um, in Radcliffe Yard on a sunny September day early on, and one of these 50 fascinating people who I had just met was standing behind me in the barbecue line, and he asked me, how do you know if a poem is good? And I don't think I had a very good answer to that question. Um, if I was able to answer at all, I really don't remember. But what I wish I had said was, I don't. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> because the first thing that I want to say about poetry is that a poem is an utterly free space for language. The only utterly free space for language that I'm aware of. And that is what makes it indispensable to me and also what makes it political. When I first considered what I wanted to say about poetry to potential readers who had not yet found their way there, my impulse was to write a manifesto or even a rant. Um, but then I thought maybe that we hear quite enough ranting these days. And, and maybe the rant is devalued right now like a currency. So. Um, maybe another mode I felt would be more useful and buy more. Um, so I decided instead to ask some questions, which is poetry's most important job anyway, to get you to listen and to get you to wonder. Um, so who really listens to a shouter? And who wonders on command? It's my hope that questions, like a poem, will be more effective in getting the mind to participate in making the meaning of what I want to say here. Uh, because another thing that I believe about poems is that they, more than any other kind of text, um, invite or even demand that the readers lean in and become active participants in the joyful task of making meaning. Another reason why reading or writing poetry is a political action. Before I get to the questions, I want to point out that poetry seems to get attention in the mainstream culture in only two sets of circumstances. First, every year or so, the New York Times or the Atlantic or some other media outlet with cultural prestige features an article with a title like, Does Poetry Matter? Or Can Poetry Matter? Or Why Doesn't Poetry Matter Anymore? And then the second set of circumstances is in times of public trauma or crisis, like our current trauma or like the aftermath of 9-11, um, the New York Times or the Atlantic or some other media outlet with cultural prestige features an article with a blunt title like, Americans turn to poetry in times of crisis. As if to keep us from panicking, it's time to break out the poems like expired Ativans that have been sitting in the nightstand drawer. Both kinds of articles diminish the value of poetry. And if my questions do take a ranting or politi political tone, it's this mainstream diminishment that I'm talking back to. After all, the New York Times never asks, does football matter? Or do restaurants matter? Or does television matter? So here are my questions. How many people have to read a poem to make it worth writing? Do the people have to be alive at the time the poem is written? Does it matter that the Super Bowl will always have more fans than any poem I write? If you think maybe it does matter, do you apply this capitalist mode of value to everything in your life? How impoverished would your life be if you did? Would poetry be more valued if it cost more and took up more space? Isn't it cool that poetry is the ultimate reality show, a site for confusion, ambivalence, complexity, uncertainty, and big and tiny feelings? Isn't it cool that in a world of increasing specialization, a poet is the ultimate generalist whose area is nothing less general than what it feels like to be human? 
Could poetry have begun as the chanting of vowel sounds around a communal fire or by mothers to infants? Which is more important, your mother singing to you or your mother telling you to eat your beets? Which came first? Which is more fundamental to you? Which makes you human? The poetry I love most, as Judy so acutely pointed out, partakes of song. If you like music and you like language, you're the target market. If a society doesn't value poetry, the most essential art, if, I may be biased about that, um, because it is solely made from the very language that makes us human, is poetry fucked up or is the society fucked up? Do we have other evidence that our society is fucked up? Is it possible everything that can be done is being done to numb you to the essential and infinitely subtle suffering and joy of being alive? Is it possible that poetry wants to awaken your awareness of the essential and infinitely subtle joy and suffering of being alive? Is it possible that poetry can awaken you without telling you exactly how? Do we need to discuss difficulty? Is difficulty something to discuss or something to experience, or both? Has your life been without difficulty? Do you know from difficulty? Poems know from difficulty, too. Why shouldn't a poem create a space for difficulty? Paraphrasing the poet Catherine Wagner, do you like understanding so much you want, to happen, you want it to happen over and over? Could it be that not understanding or wondering is more honest and even less violent than knowing? If you can't go that far, is it possible at least every once in a while? Can something be difficult and also a pleasure? Could part of poetry's difficulty be that poems are made from something we've depended on since toddlerhood to communicate our basic needs? Is it a little disconcerting to encounter language that doesn't have so much interest in informational exchange? Could it be OK that language can be used to communicate basic physical and emotional needs and information and also to make crafted objects, i.e. poems? Some water you drink, some water you swim in, some water sprays up out of an ornamental fountain. Can you enjoy an art form that uses language like paint on a canvas? Can you enjoy an art form that uses language like notes on a staff? Can you enjoy an art form that uses language to make a frame for a picture that never quite gets hung at the museum? Could it be OK to use language to give pleasure? Could this pleasure be an act of resistance, resistance against the debasement of language? Are you starting to want some answers? <laughs> Here's one possible answer. Poetry opens up spaces for language that echo through centuries. Poetry is the fresh stream that feeds the lake of language. Other streams also pour into the lake with waters not so fresh and lively. In fact, some of the other streams are dull or toxic or fake. Poetry replenishes and restores the lake of language. Do you need fresh water only under drought conditions, or do you need it all the time? Even if you don't drink directly from the spring of poetry, you drink from the lake of language the spring has fed and sweetened. Even if you don't read poetry, I assure you that poetry is whispering to you and maybe waiting for you to jump in. Thank you. <laughs>
like frequent interruptions in the poem's basic narrative. And for anyone who's familiar with Elizabeth Bishop's poetry, um, the echoes of her that you hear are very intentional. Um, it's called, this is maybe a little daring to lead with a poem called On Boredom. Um, but yes, my first poem is called On Boredom. <laughs> One Saturday, Saturday, when my time comes, among my last thoughts will be that I did not fully appreciate Saturdays. My Aunt Anne, who died this month, took me to my first Broadway show, Fiddler on the Roof. She took me and five cousins on an early morning bus from the Albany Trailway Station to Port Authority. She treated us to lunch and then to a matinee. I ate fried chicken for lunch, a food I now abhor for reasons of taste and ethics, neither of my will doing, but products of the passage of time and consciousness. Then I was beguiled by the red plastic basket where the golden chicken rested and had an orange drink and junior mints in the theater. Of the show, I remember Matchmaker, Matchmaker, and how the three daughters found their matches, true love, which of course came with the iconic problems, money, religion, politics. But we, the audience, knew an inescapable pair when we saw it. I was only nine, but wished that I could be a pair too. What a limited life I had. I was nine. I didn't know any Jews, though I'd later marry a Jew, who has sheltered me from iconic problems, who has worked so I could work on poems that don't earn money. Sitting in the dark, full of chicken and sweetness made me drowsy and dull. My critical sense, such as it was at nine, absolutely dulled. To this day, I can't sit in a theater and feel anything but grateful to the actors and musicians. I have no critical sense. This was not the kind of boredom I had felt the year before at the Baseball Hall of Fame, where my father, Aunt Anne's brother, who has seen me through life to this day, has cushioned me through, led me around a room filled with nothing more entertaining than three walls of bronze plaques. This was not that kind of boredom. It was boredom of my will doing, abstracted extravagance, a red velvet cushioned cocoon of mindlessness. This sumptuous mindlessness is what I cultivate when I let a poem begin. Unlike the show's three daughters, Aunt Anne was not a pair. She was an unmarried woman, considered pitiable in that family and at that time. She lived all her life with her parents and after they died alone. She enjoyed theater and gambling, also took me to my first bingo night, and vivid conversations around her mother's kitchen table, later hers. Every Sunday there I was, bored by the grown-up talk and breathing secondhand cigarette smoke. What a limited life she had. With her fire and ice lipstick and heavy gold bangles, didn't she have ambitions? I think she was ambitious to take six kids all that way. Must, ambitious, must ambition be performance? Does ambition only count if many people see? Many needs defining. And if the people aren't your immediate family? After the show, we boarded a crowded trailways bus back home. We kids were sleepy, wired, and fractious. The seats in pairs, I had to sit next to a stranger, a man who looked to a nine-year-old who didn't know any professors like a professor. He wore dark-framed glasses, like my father's, a tweed cap. The little pinpoint light shone down on him. He read first a magazine and then a book. He had a leather briefcase full of books and magazines. I had nothing to read but my playbill. I read front to back, then back to front, then started over again. The man, although absorbed in his own reading, must have noticed because he took the magazine, National Geographic, out from his briefcase and gave it to me. 
Maybe you'd like to read this? He smiled. In Citizen Kane, a movie I watched with my father and which didn't bore me, the accountant talks about seeing a woman in, white, in a white dress one day when he was 17 and then never again, but not a month goes by that I don't think of her. This is supposed to be a doleful mystery. He only saw her once. It's not mysterious. It is perfectly clear. The woman was his creation. He conjured her from boredom. Clarity, what use are you to me now? My mystery is this. How many days were blank of thought about Aunt Anne, who gave me this memory poem, or about my father, who gave me leisure to think about my inner life instead of about hardships and displacement? Leisure to be bored. Boredom is a withdrawal of attention. Pay attention. My aunt and cousins in the back of the bus were sleeping, snuffling close but separate, dreaming privately, thrilling dreams probably, for dreams are never boring, unlike the magazine, so kindly offered but, photo of bleak hot desert, photo of frozen mountain, so boring. My eyes were dim with sleepiness and the strain of reading in the dark, and something else, a look I carry to this day, no matter what I'm reading, even when I'm reading, that says, hungry, hungry, please won't you give me something to read. So the next two poems I'm going to read also have an early fall semester connection. Back in August, I think it was, I got an email from Meg Rotzell asking me to contribute something to the gallery exhibit that was meant to showcase the work of the incoming fellows. And I couldn't imagine what I could possibly send to her that she would want to put on the wall of an art gallery, and told her so. And she just sort of persisted and encouraged me to think of something with a visual element. And finally, I thought of these next two poems. They appear in my most recent book, The Do-Over, and they do have a visual element because they're acrostics, which mean that they spell out the name of their subject. They're part of a little suite of elegies for famous people that appear in the book, which is an exploration of death in a variety of forms. Acrostics as a form were widely used in 19th century morning poetry, and they seem to form a kind of like gravestone on the page, a kind of engraved monument to the one who has gone. And I'm going to show you the first one now. So you can see, this is a poem for Amy Winehouse. And you can see how in the left column, if you read down, it spells out her name. And so the other Radcliffe connection with this poem is that, um, and the, one, the companion poem that goes with it, is that I've been working with my research partner, Daniela Mulaisen, to translate the book into Spanish. And she has done such an amazing job of rising to the challenge of putting up with my insistence on complicated forms like this, and also maintaining the music and the content of these poems. So I'm going to read this one, and then I'm going to ask her to come up and read the translation. Uh, which you'll also see next, and then uh, another acrostic elegy and the translation for that. So, Amy Winehouse. All song is formal, and you maybe felt this and decided you'd be formal too. The eyeliner, the beehive, formal. When a desire to escape becomes formal, it's dangerous. Then escape requires nullity rather than a walk in the park or a movie. Eventually, nullity gets harder and harder to achieve. After surgery, I had opiates. I pushed the button as often as I could. Understood by music was how I felt. An escape so complete it became a song. After that, Elegies, the only necessary form. 
Amy Winehouse. A lo mejor supiste que cada canción es formal, y a lo mejor sentiste esto y decidiste ser formal también. El delineador, el peinado, formal. Fuerte como el whisky, cuando el deseo para escapar se vuelve formal, inevitablemente es peligroso. El escape necesita nulidad, no solo una caminata en el parque o una película. Eventualmente, la nulidad se vuelve más y más difícil, hasta que es casi imposible sostenerla. Después de mi cirugía, tomé opiaceos. Presioné el botón cada vez que pude. Unida con la música, me sentí. Un escape tan completo que se volvió una canción. Después de eso, la elegía es la única forma necesaria. And the next little elegy is for Donna Summer. This course that night concerned the warm-blooded love we felt. On the divan and in the ballroom and on the terrace, we felt it. Now virtue meant liking the look of the face we lay next to. Never mind the sting of the winter solstice. All discourse that night concerned the warm-blooded love we felt. Something lifted us higher. Her little finger told her so, untangling with careless skill the flora of the sexual grove. Master physician with a masterly joy in wrapping up mud-spattered, coke-dusted wounds at midnight when it's too early to stop dancing and go home. Our lily minds, soothed by her royalty, concealed in the synthesizers in the flora of the sexual grove. Donna Summer. Discurso de la noche fue acerca del amor apasionado que sentimos. Observamos que hasta en el diván y en la sala de baile y en la terraza lo sentimos. Nuestras caras reflejando la virtud mientras que nos acostábamos juntos. No nos preocupamos por el dolor del solsticio del invierno. Aquí todo el discurso de la noche fue acerca del amor apasionado que sentimos. Sale que algo nos ayudó a ascender. Su dedo pequeño le dijo, una magia natural desenredando la flora en la arboleda sexual, un médico magistral que desea solo vendar las heridas de la medianoche, enlodadas, cubiertas con polvo de coca. Es muy temprano para terminar de bailar. Nuestras mentes lilis tranquilizadas por su realeza que se esconde en los sintetizadores de la flora en la arboleda sexual. Okay, so um, the next poem is what I spent, or excerpts from what I spent the bulk of last semester writing which is a long diary poem based on notes I had made last July during a road trip I took with my daughter. It was the summer before she went to college and we decided, we're, we're a family who loves nutty road trips, so we decided we were gonna drive from the, northern po the northernmost point in the continental United States to the southernmost point. Um, so I, I want to share a little of that diary poem, it, which turned out to be so much more epic than I ever dreamed it was going to be, but that's the result of having all this time. It's, it's clocking in right now at around 50 pages. Uh, there is an entry for almost every day in July 2016, and the poem is written in diary form with the date and the location as headers. There are prose sections, sections written in syllabic verse, and some freestanding poems with separate titles that kind of act as lyric interludes um, apart from, or in counterpoint to the diary sections. And because of the time, July 2016, and the places, basically the heart of the United States, where we were traveling, um, it is a mother-daughter story, but it's also more, and there's a lot of political reverberations. 
My daughter's name is Muriel, and she's usually called Muri in the poem and, and in real life. And my husband's name is Rob, and he was there for part of the trip. So, July, oh, let me get rid of this. Here. July 16th, Branson, Missouri, which I don't know if anyone has ever been there, but it's basically, yeah, <laughs> got a very, um, it's basically the, like, Las Vegas of the Ozarks. Um, so, <laughs> Branson, Missouri. I woke up to Rob's salty smell and the fucking sun. Replica of Empire State Building topped by King Kong. At first, I think it's the World Trade Center Tower with its plume of smoke. Replica of Titanic. We're each given a passenger's name and have to wait until the end of the tour to find out whether we survive. <laughs> I survive. Mary survives. Rob, as a cr male crew member, doesn't survive. Toy Museum. Quotes from Bible on walls. BB gun annex. Segregated cabinets with black Sambo and Aunt Jemima dolls. Careless piles, dusty board games, unloved dolls. What I thought I had learned about towns, where there is money, towns are pleasant, and where there is no money, towns are unpleasant. But there has to be a quietness, too. We play mini golf, our family sport, at Pirate's Cove. And then here's one of the standalone poems, which is called Mini Golf. The object of the game is to be a family sport. The object of a family is to self-destruct. Mini golf, like a family, creates its own artificial world. Mini golf, like a family, trades in myths and legends. In both, there is the illusion of individuality, club heights, ball colors, contradiction, rebellion, separation. Both are at their most intense in summer. Money troubles tend to disrupt each. The mini golf boom of the early 20th century came to an end during the economic depression in the late 1930s. Mini golf and families are for those who wish the past different. Mini golf was invented in the United States, as was my family. The object of the United States is to self destruct. Can I prevent it with my pink putter and orange ball? driving into the artificial sand trap or farther, far into the myth of the unblemished, bloody summer? July 25th, Key West, Florida. That was our final destination. Posh white town with a mask of slackerdom. Somebody made the money, who and how. Bernie addressing the DNC now, a moment that could or should have been. Muri says they all sound so fake. I'm reading books of poetry like they're clementines and I have scurvy. Spar, Buffum, Schiff, Mayer, white women. There's whiskey in the jar, Confederate flag on the car. Roosters strutting around Old Town remind me of Elizabeth Bishop's war poem, White Woman. Walk to southernmost point. Waves slapped the embankment, and we slapped the concrete buoy, buoy monument. Made it. We produced by far the most progressive platform in the history of the Democratic Party, says Bernie. I am proud to stand with her. Oh, this is a little standalone poem. On gender. I said to Muri over key lime pie that we need more feminine energy in power to challenge the patriarchy. I meant Bernie. She disagreed. She doesn't think anything is gendered. I modified. Nurturing energy instead of dominating energy. Then she could agree. Are mothers always a mystery to daughters? I don't want to be. July 26, Key West, Florida. Last night, the convention, I was so dispirited that I wanted to open the bottle of Two Buck Chuck the Miami Airbnb host left and drink myself to sleep. Today I'm more resigned and because we have to move on into the future, I have hope. Yuri in pain from her period today. 
We did next to nothing, late brunch and visit to Hemingway's house. Highlight the six toad cats, of course. Dropped Mary off at our room, then walked to Elizabeth Bishop's house. And this is a, a little poem called On Memory, and then in parentheses, On Poetry, I couldn't decide. <laughs> it seems to fit both. And the first line is, I remember it, and that refers to Elizabeth Bishop's house to, in Key West, which I walked to. I remember it from 2000 as a white house with a very high white fence around it. Either someone took down the fence or else I'm misremembering. Or maybe she had two addresses in Key West. And my poem about the house with the sign about dog sweaters, found in my first book, may be a complete figment too. No sign except for one next to the front door that said, hippies use back door, and a formal plaque on the gate. First I typed fate. In the noiseless siesta streets, Lots of meaty succulents, lots of scattered stone. I remember a story I heard about Elizabeth Bishop and her lover, Louise Crane, how they bought a house together in Key West, and then Louise went back to New York, and Elizabeth wrote letter to New York for her. In your next letter, I wish you'd say where you are going and what you are doing. And then Elizabeth surprised Louise by paying a, bit, a visit and was in turn surprised to find Louise in bed with a musician friend. When Elizabeth told the story afterwards, she named Billie Holiday. Then I remember her poem with the cringeworthy title, Songs for a Colored Singer. The time has come to call a halt, and so it ends. Then I remember how tired I am of sleeping alone. Mary and I talked about how to deal with her period at college. Like me, she has just 24 bad hours a month. She said she'll just go to her classes and spend the rest of the 24 hours in bed. I tell her about tribes that have separate huts where menstruating women can be outside of their daily lives, be taken care of by the other women. They also stay in bed, swaddled along with their newborns for a month after they give birth. That always sounded right to me. Later, we go out for ice cream, sweat sluicing our backs. I ask for chocolate, amaretto, and a cone. The depressed-looking manager, a white guy around 60, says, the flavors with alcohol are too soft for cones. I'm sure you know that alcohol doesn't freeze. A futile bit of information. No, I didn't know, but OK. He looks at me blankly and offers to accommodate ice cream in a dish with cones stuck on top. So the next poem is outside of that diary poem. It comes from the domestic experience, which we probably all had, of lifting up a chair cushion and finding objects underneath it. So I, I did that, and I took a picture, and I posted it on Facebook, and someone commented that it, the picture looked like a Joseph Cornell box. And then I took a closer look, and I did find a kind of coherence and emotion in the grouping of objects. So I'm going to show you the photo. There we go. <laughs> so the poem is written in a list form. I list each object and then do a little riff on it. Don't judge me for my poor housekeeping <laughs> skills. Which my, and my poor housekeeping skills are in the poem. So at least I'm honest about it. Um, and the poem is called Found Under a Chair Cushion. One, dark brown hair tie. One of a set, once primly wrapped around a card, in varying shades of brown, meant to match the ponytail of anyone who wanders into the CVS. I don't know what color my hair is. So long have I paid to have it painted gold as an October leaf when the pavement is cool and wet. Two, Mad Men DVD season one, disc one. I tried to watch it, I really did. <laughs> it turned into an elephant lumbering toward me. Then it tiptoed like a Disney elephant, eyeing me coyly. But lumbering and shilly-shallying are faddish. I wanted a bullet, express and true. 
I've always been a boy in that way. The boys on the disc are splendid and shaved, in white shirts, courtiers forming a circle around the Sun King. While the velvet folds of my spirit slept, I tried to believe I owed it to my generation to act as a dutiful audience member. In other words, even in the presence of the Sun King, I tried being good, but I got bored. Three, flyer for house cleaning service. Life's too short to clean your own home. I agreed and the family flew apart. Couch flew apart, hand towels flew apart. Dust overwhelms the lungs twice daily. Homer, for example, has never been out of print. Is it because he lacked ambition for the clean life? Capitalism plus art plus laziness, a dangerous formula. Four, seven dimes and one penny. Dimes are jewelry, pretty beyond what monetary value we endow them with. With 71 cents, I could buy almost three quarters of a Snickers bar, but I'm off sugar. 71 cents is what I need for three and a half minutes of garage parking on 12th Street while I teach the willing and unwilling how to laugh and cry about line breaks. Or the amount I earn for every dollar earned by a man. Or shall I adorn myself with coins like a mad girl in tatters? Five, tweezer. It is time. It is time to wrench out all the ugly hairs. The Sun King approacheth. <laughs> Six, red haired play school plastic kid dressed in jeans and gray hoodie, paint spattered. This small person appears to be angry, having spent 10 years under a chair cushion, <laughs> having first suffered abuse during some long forgotten crafts project. He is furious, but is nevertheless giving me a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> So the next poem is an example of L'Esprit de l'Escalier. Um, some of you probably know that's the French name for literally the wit of the staircase. And it's, it's the name for the experience of thinking up the perfect retort for something only after you've left the party and are walking downstairs. Um, a couple of years ago, I gave a reading. And after the reading, a poet who was in the audience came up to me and said, your poems are good, eccentric, but good. And so if I had come up with the perfect response to that, I wouldn't have had to write this poem. <laughs> the poem references Emily Dickinson and her habit of making little crosses on her manuscripts to denote alternative words. So like she'd write a line and put a little cross next to one of the words, and then somewhere else on the page, She'd put another little cross with an alternate word. Um, so she didn't, either she didn't get around to finalizing or because she didn't, wasn't planning to publish it, she didn't want to finalize or as I choose to think of it, she just was really making great use of that utterly free space of the poem that I talked about. Um, and you'll see that I too incorporate multiple possibilities for words in my poem. Um, it also has a quote from Emily Dickinson, which is uh, something she wrote in one of her letters, all men say what to me, meaning that she'd often say something to a man and get a response, what? <laughs> like, no one understood her because she was too brilliant. And then there's a, a tad bit of French in the first stanza. Um, so, un Francais is a French man. And in the poem, this French man says, say show, eh? Which just means it's hot, right? It's hot, isn't it? So. To the poet who after my reading said, your poems are good, eccentric but good. Imagine that you at 18 in Paris for the first time with all your loving ideals about penises intact, 
in your new mini trench coat and smelling the smell of garlic and unfiltered smoke and assaultive coffee were approached from behind. Imagine un Francais, bald, smooth, spectacled, grabbed your right hand and pressed it to his yes, soft, yes, exposed penis and hissed, say show, eh? as he kept walking past you, shaking with his poor French demented laughs. Would you say trauma? It wasn't. Would you think poem fodder? Would you bring to bear your rhetoric textbook and wall of metaphors built up from yes, stone, yes, sky, yes, Shakespeare? You know not arrogant mentioned your encroaching baldness, which I said that I, yes, liked. You were not spectacled nor smooth, but admire, I think, smoothness. You didn't want to say bad. You couldn't commit to good. Smoothly, the current does not run. Smoothness can never shock. When electricity veins through the sky, is that really its best, its crispest manifestation? Must Emily Dickinson ride through the, yes, cloud dark sky on a flashing bolt? screaming, all men say, what to me? Hands tattooed with the small crosses that meant she couldn't choose, settle on an ideal word, abandon possibility fairer than prose for a what word? Imagine the same hot lightning snaking up your rectum. That was childbirth, 14 hours hard work. And my husband's smell and my cow moans and the doula's watered down grape juice helped. I couldn't call it pain, no, orgasm, no, earthquake, closer, but no. But I wanted so to call it something. This is the merry disease we share. I suspected that the Queen's English and I would not run smoothly then. So I wept past imagining. Is it possible that death will be a yes? Immortality, not a marble stone, but a what, maxi pad? A silver perfume? There is no yes true metaphor, each eccentric as the others. When I dab my wrists and neck with the oily rollerball of my favorite perfume essence, Rain by Terra Nova, a bargain at yes, less than $20 for 0.3 ounces notes of lily of the valley, clover, and musk, I do it because it smells fresh, like a new earth. Imagine that same lightning struck you down on the new earth dead. You'd say critical judgment, I'd say poor social skills. Imagine instead the lightning struck the earth and a laurel bloomed where once stood only tombstones. I know it's hard to be a man with an ideal between your legs and nothing but Shakespeare's cold lightning waiting for you on judgment day. Let's wait together. We open our hearts and dictionaries. You were waiting, weren't you, for me to say, gee, thanks, and are still what? Yes, no, waiting? So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So this is the last poem. And it's an example, I think, of a poem that's song-like. I've always been obsessed with the idea of radical inclusion, with the idea of making a poem that I could put everything in. So that's impossible, but I do keep trying. And this is a poem where I was trying to do that. And it's just called Go. So I send you forth with it. It is a cube, it is red, it is mountainous. It is a bird of fire, it is the bones of the pelvis, it is a walnut, it is treasured. It is yellow Saturn wobbling in its orbit. It is danger squawking. It is the desire to sit down with strangers in cafes, and then it is the strangers in cafes. It is the man with the black t-shirt labeled unarmed civilian, and it is the blind man with him and his painful trembling. Always it is oxygen and more oxygen. It is the fight in you and the fight in you dying. It is the need for water and the water that falls from the sky. It is desperate for a theory and it is the acts you call evil when you know there is no evil, only desperation. It is that bravery, that arrogance, that blindness. 
It is the pink morning and your smile in the pink morning. It is a phantom and the thin neck of a tree. It is a little project called loving the world. It is howling in the dirt. It is an extravaganza. It's the abandoned sports bra in the dirt beside howling you. It's the wind chimes in the thin neck tree and it is tongue tied. It is asleep. It is waking up now. It is a small cat on the bed. It is the threads of the leaf and it is the three graces splendor, mirth, and good cheer. It is their heartfelt advice. You can't let it hurt you. You must let it hurt you. It is a careless error and the hotel pool blue with chemistry. It's a kiss, of course it is a kiss. It's an old strange book, newly acquired but not yet cataloged, it is crazy. It is you crazy with honesty and crazy with ambition. It's the sun that stuns over and over again. It's your tablet, which is every tablet everywhere. It's an explosion. It is every explosion everywhere. It is pavement, mineral and hot and wet with droplets. It's the stars that pitch white needles into the pond. It is provable. It is a lotion. It is a lie. It is a baby because everyone is a baby. It talks to you, always to you. It moves swiftly, it is stuck. It moves swiftly, it is stuck. It moves swiftly. It's the impenetrable truth, now clear as ice. It is serious, it is irreversible. It is going, going. It is flying now, laughing, strong enough to know anything. Thank you very much. <laughs>